Hello, and welcome back to the Flow and Flourish podcast. I am your host and capacity coach, Nicole Roan, and I'm glad to have you here today. Happy New Year, by the way. 2021, like, I don't know about y'all, but I'm super excited about 2021. I know in 2020, there was a lot that happened, but there's a lot that happens every year, right? Maybe not on the scale of a pandemic and witnessing a lot of the things that we witnessed in the media, but I will say that every year there are a multitude of things that happen. But as a capacity coach, I know all too well that different seasons call for different levels of capacity. So I'm excited about 2021. I hope that you are too. And I'm really glad that you are here listening to the podcast today because we have my girl, Evelyn, that we are talking to. And many of us really do around, you know, the new year. We do the new year, new me. And throughout December, I did a bunch of self-care series, had a bunch of phenomenal women on the podcast. And today is going to be no different. I wanted to actually wrap that series up while at the same time taking us on a journey and starting us off the right way in the new year, if you are looking to become fit, like, I don't know, 85% of the rest of the world, right? You're trying to get fit, but this is going to be a little bit different. While Evelyn is a fitness coach, it's not just about being fit on the outside. It's about making those changes internally. So we're carrying through with self-care, but putting a little bit of a twist on it with fitness. And so I am super excited to share her with you today. If this is your very first time here, thank you for joining the sister circle of like-minded women who are trying to figure out how to manage wearing multiple hats and dealing with competing priorities at the same time. This is the safe space that we talk openly and honestly about all of that jazz. And you also get a bunch of different tips, resources, and information on how to do just that. And as your capacity coach, I'm here to help you increase your capacity by creating balance between your personal and your professional life. So welcome to your new favorite space to be. We are all glad to have you. Before I jump in and introduce Evelyn, I want to let you know that this episode is being brought to you by the Capacity Calculator. And if this is your first time hearing about that, well, listen up because the Capacity Calculator is a tool that I developed for busy, high-performing women to help us really take stock and inventory of what's actually on our plates. This tool allows you to figure out what's really on your plate where your priorities lie, and help you know where you're at capacity-wise. So head on over to NicoleRone.com to check out the Capacity Calculator, and you can also find it in both Facebook and Instagram. Okay, let's talk about Miss Evelyn. I met her in a business mastermind like I did many of the other women that I've had here on this podcast. And when we first connected, I was just instantly drawn to her. So about her specifically, Evelyn is the owner of Evelyn Lavasser Fitness, which is a company that focuses on helping busy, overwhelmed moms reach their body goals without dieting or deprivation. Yes, I said without depriving themselves. Evelyn knows that moms can be especially hard on themselves and expect perfection in our homes, jobs, marriages, and of course within our bodies. She wants every woman to know that she can want to change her body and love it all at the same time. Most importantly, Evelyn knows that moms want what's best for their children and having negative feelings about ourselves can lead our children to have negative feelings about themselves too. So, Evelyn is sure to approach all things from the angle of knowing that our actions shape our children and the legacies of the health we will leave them. Evelyn is a certified group and personal trainer, a hormonal fat loss coach, and has a specialization in behavior change. She also has a BA in psychology and a master's in education. Help me welcome my girl Evelyn to the Flow and Flourish podcast. I am super excited to sit here and talk to you too. (laughs) So I typically have people kind of start off and just 
tell me a little bit about how they ended up in the space that they're in. Mm. And I know that you are in the fitness and wellness space. And why don't you give us your official title, kind of what you do and how you ended up where you are? All right. Well, I'm going to give you my whole story here. I'm ready. So, <laughs> I'm Evelyn Lavasser and I own Evelyn Lavasser Fitness. I have certifications in nutrition, personal training, and I also have a specialization in behavior change. Prior to my life in health and wellness, I was a teacher. I have a bachelor's degree in psychology and a master's in education. So you gifted, gifted. <laughs> oh my gosh. I am full of knowledge, <laughs> full of knowledge that I haven't always put to use. You know, I went into teaching because I felt like that's what I was supposed to do. You know, my parents were both like civil service. My dad was a fireman. My mom owned a daycare, a very large daycare with a big preschool program. And we kind of were taught growing up that like, you know, your job is something where you help other people, you know, try to get in somewhere there's a union and you put in your 30 plus years and then you start living later. So I kind of followed that path because I felt like it was what I had to do. You know, 11 years later, I realized that I, I was forcing myself to go into work. I was just very unhappy, very unfulfilled, overwhelmed. I felt invisible. You know, I realized that teachers are expected to live and breathe their profession. Mm -hmm. You know, you are a dedicated individual, but the expectation is almost that it's your priority even when you leave the building. Mm -hmm. And when you want to do a good job, it affects your home life and it affected the way I was showing up for my kids and it affected the way I was showing up with my husband. And I felt extra stressed and I wasn't taking the best care of myself. Now, mind you, while I was teaching, I was also personal training and nutrition coaching part-time. Okay. So right in that 10th year, I started talking to my husband, like I am struggling to do this. I don't know that I can do it much longer. And we budgeted like crazy and I left and I pursued nutrition and personal training full-time. Mm, yeah, that was exciting. <laughs> yeah, it was exciting, you know, but it's funny to see like the transformation mentally that took place with me also, because in the beginning, in my mind, it was all about food and exercise. So when I worked with women, I worked with some men too, but mostly women, I helped them try to change their eating habits. And I got together these excellent workout plans. And ultimately, they'd rebound. And it took a long time to realize that if we weren't tackling any mindset barriers and we weren't tackling any habit change, it would always be a matter of rebounding because you're not figuring out how did I get here? What decisions did I make that brought me here? What did I actually change beside my food? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're always going to rebound because you're not handling the real issue, which is inside. Yes. And that's really good because in this community, we talk a lot about mindset and how that definitely impacts us from a physical and emotional perspective. And so I love that you are tackling it from a mindset perspective. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit about why you ended up in the space outside of, you know, not really being fulfilled in the teacher mm -hmm. space. So give mm -hmm. us your story, Miss Lady. Okay. So growing up, I was very athletic, had a cute little figure, got a lot of attention for it. You got the hey girl, hey. The hey girl, hey. You know, I got a lot of comments on the bootay and the <laughs> waist and, you know, <laughs> so, so much that, you know, eventually I can honestly say that I was hearing comments about my body as early as nine and 10 years old. Wow. Um, yeah. And I didn't recognize it until I was much older, like. I was in fourth grade the first time a boy told me that I had a fat mm. butt, but it became so much that I identified with that part of me. It didn't matter that like I was a straight A student. It didn't matter that I was a gifted athlete. I got constant attention for what I looked like. So that became who I was so much that when I went to college and found, you know, that freshman 15, I also tried my first diet. Mm -hmm. and kind of lost touch with myself because, you know, dieting kind of gives you this false sense of control. Like I'm in control. I can just manipulate my food and change my body. Like this is easy mm -hmm. until it's not, you know? <laughs> so I dieted on and off. I did Weight Watchers. I did Atkins. I did like low carb, no carb. I fasted. I did shakes. And every single time 
I lost weight and felt great and was motivated. And every single time when that motivation time period passed, I rebounded, put weight back on, felt guilty, felt ashamed of myself. And of course, it's not me who's the issue. It's got to be the diet. I'm just going to try another diet, right. you know? So I kept doing that. I got married when I was about 27 to my husband, who I've known since I was 12. Mm-hmm. And he wanted kids like immediately. And of course, thinking I'm in control, I didn't want kids yet. So about two years later, I literally woke up one morning and was like, okay, let's do this. I'm ready. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm We're going to be parents now. Yeah, I'm ready. Here we go. And I got pregnant immediately. And about five weeks later, I found out that I was miscarrying. And, you know, I have to be honest, at that time, I felt like still hopeful because the doctors explained to you that it's a lot more common, especially with first pregnancies. So we tried again pretty quickly and I got pregnant again really quickly. And I was very sick. I had that horrible morning sickness. And I was in church. I was about 15 weeks. I'm in church with my mom and my sister. And I was like, oh my gosh, here I go. I'm going to throw up again. So I get up to use the bathroom. And when I stood up, Nicole, my, I don't know how to describe it other than my insides felt hollow. Like I was empty. And I, I knew instantly I wasn't okay. So I just sat down and I'm like, all of that illness, that sick feeling went away. And I called the doctor, obviously, and they told I had miscarried again. And I feel like, you know, the second time was so different because first of all, I was further along and I had started seeing some changes to my body, but also you start to feel like you can't trust your body and you start to label yourself like you're defective. I can't do this thing that women just do like That you're supposed to be able to do, right? Exactly, exactly. And I felt like I was letting my husband down, you know? He wanted kids so bad. And I had always felt like I knew I was going to be a mom. I never questioned a different alternative. I just knew that that was going to be my role. And now, you know, I had a family member that I loved tell me, you know, it's time to like knock it off. Like it's time for you to accept that maybe you're not supposed to be a mom. I'm sorry, what? Yeah. Like maybe you're not supposed to be a mom and you're pushing it too hard. And this is God's way of telling you to knock it off. So of course you're devastated, devastated. And you kind of get into this dark place of just constantly questioning yourself and your purpose and your meaning and your body and, and all of it. And, you know, it took us about a year and we decided to try again. That's scary. Terrifying. You know, and we decided to try as a last resort prior to maybe doing in vitro if needed. And of course, the third time I get pregnant immediately. And because I was considered high risk, I had to go in for uh, blood work Mm biweekly and doctor's visits biweekly. And I swear every single time I walked into the doctor's office, I just knew like, this is the time they're going to tell me that there's no baby there. Mm -hmm. And every time I went in, they told me, you know, everything's okay you're doing well. I did get put on bed rest for three months. Mm -hmm. And again, still visiting, everything's okay. And I, I saw my belly grow. I would watch the baby move inside and I would never let myself get excited. Like I would lay on the couch. I can picture myself picking my shirt up and watching my belly move and telling myself like, don't get excited because this baby's going to be gone. This is just what happens with you. Like she's going to be gone. Oh, it was so, I can't describe to you that, that feeling of like teetering. You so want to be excited, but you're so terrified to let yourself feel hope because it'll destroy you if it doesn't work out again. You know, I ended up having a scheduled C-section because of, you know, some physical complications and doctor put that baby next to me and I looked at her little face and I'm telling you, I still... I still wasn't processing that this baby was real. And when she cried, I heard her cry. I lost it, lost it because I felt like, oh my God, oh my God, she's real. And I'm trembling and I'm sobbing. And she was my miracle. And at that second, I said, I'm going to be the best mom ever. Like, I'm not just going to be a good mom. 
I'm going to make sure that I raise her to be a great person. Like I took pride in that. And I made sure that everything that I did as a mom was focused on what was best for her, not just like giving her what she needed. I mean, providing her with the tools to be the best human being that she could be free of judgment, free of, you know, negativity, free of self-consciousness. But what I didn't ever think about was how other people would affect her. So I tell this story of, (laughs) ooh, then other people come into the picture and, you know, they have their own issues that they are putting out without even realizing it, right? So we're at a picnic one day and I'm with her. She was 10 and I have my other little girl. So two girls and I give them their lunch, two baby girls. I give them their lunch, a burger, some corn on the cob and a green salad. And a woman says to my 10 year old, Honey, if you want to keep that figure, you better lay off them burgers. At 10? And she's 10. <laughs> she's 10. She's 10. And the thing is, you're shocked immediately. Like, you're shocked. A part of you, you kind of feel a little bit ragey. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it reminded me that that's how early it was when I started hearing things about my body. Yeah. Um, you know, so it come full circle. And that's when I realized, like, we as women don't understand that this self-consciousness that we feel, this need to look perfect, we kind of do it to ourselves and we perpetuate it by judging other women that same way. And even though I don't believe that this woman intentionally was trying to put negative thoughts about food and body image in my daughter's head, Mm -hmm. she was sharing her own feelings about how she feels when she eats certain foods you know? And I feel like that's where it comes from, you know? So on that day is when I said to myself, like, I have things that need to be said and I need women to understand that it's not about us. Like we feel these insecurities, but we're passing it on from generation to generation. And we can be the catalyst for change, not only for ourselves, but for our kids and for their kids. Like this insecurity, this judgment, this need for perfection can stop with us if we empower ourselves to do that. So that's when I really started doing some deep work on myself and realizing that I had been raising my daughter very intentionally, Mm -hmm. but I was also raising her in that she was the priority, but I still wasn't, you know, Mm -hmm. I was saying, you're amazing. You're strong. You're kind, you're sensitive. And I was not believing those things about myself. Mm. So truly my words were saying one thing and my actions were teaching something different. You weren't talking the talk. I was not. And I had to understand that our lessons to our kids are not always verbal. No, I can tell you you're beautiful and you're amazing. But if you walk in my room and you catch me pinching my waistline or looking at myself negatively, you learned the opposite of what I just told you. And if we keep living that way, we kind of teach the kids that when they get older, they're almost expected to stop caring about themselves. They're expected, like we raise them right from when they're little, we raise them to feel amazing, but we teach them when they get older and become parents, they're supposed to let all that go. Because now you're not important not anymore. anymore. Oh my yes. gosh, at the same time. Yeah. Yes. yes. Especially with girls, right? Yes. Yes. Huh. So I had to first change my mindset. I had to start valuing myself mm-hmm. without putting the emphasis on my exterior. And I think about it as women, we are so quick to base our opinions on somebody else, on their character. If yeah. I'm talking about Nicole, I'm going to say she's loyal and strong and, you know, trustworthy. And if I talk about myself, I'm going to say something about my physical appearance. Like, so why is it that I am so quick to raise someone else up and put myself down? So I had to let go of that mindset. And then I had to focus on intuition. So dieting for all those years. I want to circle back to a couple of things that you said, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Just because you drop so much knowledge and so many gems and there's so much that I identified with. Mm. I think first and foremost, one of the things that you were saying about, you know, having your body look a certain way and then going through a transformation, right? Mm -hmm. 
I shared with you offline that I too had that same sort of situation, right? Where I was, I had the nice body. What'd you say? The nice bootay. Uh, the the bootay. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so I grew up feeling like my self-worth and my confidence was built on that. And mm-hmm. so after I'd had my daughter, my body changed completely and my self-esteem and self-confidence plummeted. And it took such a long time to even get it back to a state where I really, really liked myself. And if I'm mm-hmm. being honest, that's recent, like in the last couple of years, because mm-hmm. it just, when you base your confidence on your looks, on your external, and we all know our looks fade, but when that happens mm-hmm. kind of early on, it's like, oh my gosh, now what? Right. Yeah. So I want to make sure that anybody who's listening, that if that's a challenge that you're going through, first and foremost, you're not alone. Right. Mm -hmm. And we want to help you to get in line and get a mindset that's going to help you to get through that because you Mm -hmm. are so much more than your looks, so much more than your body. Yes, Mm -hmm. you want to look good and there's nothing wrong with that, but let's take a deeper dive and look internally at what's going on that's making you think that. So I just Mm -hmm. wanted to share that piece first. Yeah, I 100% agree. And I feel like for so long, I was obsessed with food and controlling like carbs and sugar and food was constantly on my mind. If I had my breakfast, I was already thinking and planning, like, what am I going to do for lunch? Right? Constantly. Oh, you're thinking about it all the time. But I learned if you are obsessing about food and body, it is because you are not at all focusing on being grateful for any part of who you are. If your energy, break that down. If your energy is completely focused on your food exterior, you have not taken a moment at all to be grateful for who you are or what you bring to the world. You know, you haven't taken the time to see like your effect on other people Mm -hmm. and how you impact them. You know, if you think about it, like, if I talk about the things that are most important to me, right? My family is my priority. Living in purpose is a priority. Helping women heal their hearts is a priority. None of those priorities that make me feel fulfilled have anything, anything to do with what I look like. None of it. So if I can take my focus and put that energy into what I'm feeling and what I bring to the world and just focus on the best parts of me, it takes the power from my exterior and decreases it and decreases it and decreases it. So every day that I wake up and give myself purpose and focus on my characteristics, suddenly my exterior loses that power that it had over me. Yes. Oh my gosh. Just so good. I know we talked a little bit too about, you know, letting go of expectations and focusing Mm -hmm. internally So I wanted to talk about trusting your body. What most people may not know, similar to you, although I haven't experienced a loss in that way during pregnancy, Mm -hmm. when I was pregnant with my son, I was super, super high risk because of some physical things with myself as well. And I also, this is probably super personal, but I had a piece of my cervix removed Mm -hmm. um, due to like pre-cancer. Mm -hmm. And so there were complications and things, and they were really, really worried. At the same time, my mom and my dad, within three months of each other, were in ICU. Like, my dad literally passed away, and then they brought him back. So that was one thing. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) And then three months either before or after, I can't remember, or three months prior, I want to say, I was on a trip in Arizona for work, and my mom had a stroke and an aneurysm. Oh, and so I'd been through so much emotionally that I was spotting and bleeding heavily all the time, so much so that I had to take progesterone to sustain the pregnancy Mm -hmm. up until like five or six months. And I was terrified, terrified is like not even enough of a word. And so like you, I didn't really believe it until he was born and I heard him cry that Mm-hmm. It was a real thing. And so I just want to first and foremost, thank you for sharing that story with us. Cause I know there are millions of women outside of me and you that have experienced that sort of thing. 
-hmm. And I know for me, it's kind of turned into trusting myself and my body, even at this Mm -hmm. state to release weight or to do the things that I know that it's capable of doing. Mm -hmm. So talk to me a little bit about what you mean when you say trust in your body and how we can get to a place of doing that if we've had, you know, emotional or physical trauma like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the truth is from the day that we were born, our bodies knew exactly what to do and knew exactly what they needed. You know, as an infant, you screamed when you were hungry. You screamed when you needed a diaper. You screamed when you needed to sleep. (laughs) And when those needs were met, you were happy. Right. So you naturally knew what to do. It wasn't until adults came into the picture and started giving us rules about eating and such that kind of made us disconnect a little bit from our own intuition. So in my house, I'm not sure how your house was, but in my house, we dealt with a lot of scarcity. You know, my parents both came from very large families and, Mm -hmm. you know, there were four children for us. Finances were tough. But it was a matter of if mommy and puppy came and told you to sit down for dinner, then you sat down for dinner and you didn't get up until that plate was clean because (laughs) otherwise it was disrespectful, right? You got to clean that plate. Don't you get up from that. You sit there until it's gone, right? If I make Um, you eat it. (laughs) That's right. That's right. Or even if, you know, you finished your dinner or excuse me, if you had your dinner and, you know, on the off chance there was dessert, you had to clear that plate in order to earn that dessert, right? Yeah. So you don't even realize that like that was the beginning of you ignoring your own hunger and fullness because you had to follow a rule. You can bring that even a step further. And I know I'm aging myself when I say this, but I remember going to the doctor and I'd get shots, right? Mm-hmm. And if you did a good job and you were crying, you'd get lollipops, right? So sweets are soothing, right? That's the lesson there. So you get a little bit of that emotional eating also. I so, never even put that together. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. Okay. You know, that's why even when I was little, if I fell, I can picture myself like crying. And of course I'd get a hug first from my parents, but then I'd either get a lollipop or an ice pop or something. And it, I made that mental connection. Like when I'm sad, I can have a sweet and I feel better. So Flash forward. And then if you're somebody who even tried hopping on that diet train, now you're talking about being completely disconnected from your intuition because now you're eating to rules. You're eating because so-and-so says you should eat every two to three hours, or you're cutting out carbs because so-and-so said those are going to make you bloated, Mm -hmm. or you're drinking a gallon of water and peeing every 15 minutes because somebody told you you had to get that water in your system all the while ignoring the fact that you're hungry and you should be eating more ignoring the fact that your body's exhausted because you need carbohydrates ignoring the fact that a gallon of water is a lot of water and not everybody (laughs) needs that you know that's a lot of water that's a lot a lot of water (laughs) I I don't finish it daily. I might get through half sometimes if I'm lucky, but I'm learning to pace myself. So, but keep going. I love what you're saying. Yeah. I just think that the more that we focus on outside sources, our parents cleaning the plate, the doctor, getting the candy, following the dieting rules, all of those things made us ignore what our body was telling us. And the truth is, if you listen, your body is going to tell you what it wants and needs. And You know, I feel like a lot of people get stuck on this. Well, if I listen to what my body tells me, I'm just going to eat Oreos all day long. (laughs) Right? Like I want Oreos all day long. And I'm going to tell you, like, I'm going to have to call bullshit on that because you can't tell me that you can sit down and eat a full pack of Oreos and you feel energized and satiated and ready for your day. Come on now. No, no. Your body doesn't want that. Habit wants that. Or the fact that you have associated that food with being bad, you know, so you feel guilty when you eat it. You don't really want that all the time. And listen, if you want Oreos, please enjoy a couple of Oreos, Mm -hmm. but don't make yourself attach an emotion to it. You are not bad because you ate sweets. Sweets taste good. So that makes me think of something we were talking about, right? Mm. How you take a totally different approach, right? 
in your coaching. Mm -hmm. So if I were to come to you and say, you know what? Chocolate is the devil. Like I cannot have chocolate in the house. It ain't going to work. Like, so how are you going to help me fix this? What are we going to do? You're going to go to the store and you're going to buy chocolate. Like a lot of it. (laughs) I'm sorry. Right. (laughs) <laughs> and you're going to be like, Evelyn, no, Mm-mm. I can't have this in the house. No, I can't have it in the house. Listen, buy the chocolate and have it every single day. I mean, have a little bit after lunch, have a little bit after dinner and do that every single day until you don't feel like it's bad mm-hmm. because letting yourself see it, letting yourself have it all the time changes that connection in your brain and lets you know, this food has no control over me. I'm in control and I can have it when I want to, you know, and I'm speaking from experience. When I tell you I am a dark chocolate with sea salt, obsessive chocolate lover. (laughs) And I can buy that. Like if they're on sale now, listen, I'm going to buy a whole big bag of those things. Mm -hmm. I guarantee they'll be here two to three months. Because you'll pace yourself and you really change the dynamic, the connection and the the mental piece around associating it with being bad. That's so wonderful. Oh my God. It just feels so comforting to know, like, this is something that I can enjoy. And I really do love the taste and the flavor and the richness of it. And I don't have to feel guilty. I can enjoy it and still feel good about myself. Yeah. Because it doesn't have power. It is just a piece of chocolate. It's just a piece of chocolate. Yeah. But the other thing is you have to couple that with focusing on how you feel. So if you're talking about like, I'm going to sit down and have my lunch in front of the television and I'm going to have my phone out and I'm going to be scrolling through social while I'm watching a program, you're not connected to your body. You're completely distracted. You're not paying attention to when you stopped feeling hungry. You're not paying attention to if your body's even satiated. You know, if you are hungry and you sit down to eat your lunch, there's literally a point in the meal, if you're paying attention to when you stop eating because it tastes delicious and you're just eating because it's there. Yes. You can feel that moment if you're paying attention. You know, sometimes if you sit down and you're having a delicious meal, you're like, oh my gosh, this is so good. Take a moment, let yourself savor that food that's in there. Try to identify different flavors, like really force yourself to connect with what's happening in your mouth and in your brain. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice sometimes halfway, three quarters through your meal, your stomach is not growling anymore. Yep. You don't have that headache anymore. You don't feel that hunger anymore. Mm -hmm. Your body's satisfied. Yep. And that's when you're supposed to stop eating. And so but normally to do that, right? Yes. Yes. You have to slow down and you have to literally ask yourself questions through your meal. How does this taste? How am I feeling? And I'm not saying like you're saying, you're not just sitting there out loud saying, well, how do I feel right now? Um, But just (laughs) being mindful. I was going to say that. So you want me to talk to myself out loud eating dinner with everybody else? Girl. I mean, stop. Don't act like you don't do that anyway. Stop. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Stop it. You know, you know, like me, that you talk to yourself sometimes because that happens. (laughs) Hey, the best people do. That's all I'm saying. Yes. Yes. Goodness. So slowing down and, you Mm -hmm. know, paying attention to what you're feeling and not just eating because the food is there or eating because it tastes so good, because those are some of the mindless behaviors that we can even be distracted by in Mm -hmm. the moment that we may not even realize. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah. And you know, one more thing that I work with people is, you know, serve your normal plate of dinner and cut like three quarters of it. And if, you know, you're not ready to be that intuitive yet and you feel like, you know, asking these questions doesn't really mean much to me, then, you know, eat that three quarters. Don't eat that last quarter yet. Get up and walk away. Mm. Give yourself 15 minutes. Come back to the table and see if you're really hungry. And if you're really hungry, then please eat the food. But if you're not, then you have an idea now of, what it really takes to satisfy your body and how you were overdoing it before. So it's just a little trick. You walk away. The thing is your brain takes about 20 minutes after eating to register that it was actually satisfied. So sometimes, and actually most times we're in a rush, right? We're eating really quickly. We have a million things we're trying to get done. 
And how many times do you eat your meal really quick? And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, my stomach. <laughs> I overdid it. Yes. I overdid it. I overdid it. Right. That was your brain. It takes 20 minutes. So you overate before your brain even realized that it was comfortable 20 minutes ago. Okay. I'm going to yeah. try that tonight because my husband made like pulled steak tacos. Mm. And I'm not going to lie. Like I sat down yesterday. Now I didn't have any rice or anything only because he didn't make any, which mm -hmm. clearly I'm a little upset about, mm -hmm. but I had, I had four tacos cause they were so mm -hmm. good. And I was so hungry. And by the third one, I was like, you know what? Like, I feel like I'm full, but I'm just going to eat this anyway. Mm -hmm. And so I know tonight for dinner, there's still some that are left if my daughter had some eating them. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to pace myself, right? Mm -hmm. Like I don't need four tacos. And then there was the guilt that came in after that, right? Yeah. Like, yes. You know that you are trying to be 10 times more fine for your birthday, which is in mm -hmm. January. Mm -hmm. Eating four tacos doesn't, you know, get you there. And then I started to rationalize, well, oh, it was just one corn tortilla, not two. And mm -hmm. I did have fresh pico de gallo on there. Just these conversations, but I'm not showing myself grace either. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so I think there's, it's also important to say, Nicole, like the tacos I'm sure are delicious. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you just tell yourself, like there's two there, right. If you were comfortable with two, okay. Those other two will be there tomorrow. Yep. And I can have them tomorrow if I want to. I don't have to eat all that right now. And that's okay. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And one of the things that I've been doing too, when it comes to what I'm eating is asking myself, am I practicing self-care? Mm -hmm. And that is something that I learned from Patrice Washington through mm -hmm. Harvey's book, Break, mm -hmm. um, Breakthrough Sold Separately. And it really talks oh. about, yeah, it's a really good book. Have you ever read it? I have not. Can you tell me that again? Yes. It's called Breakthrough Sold Separately. And I okay. the, um, I'll text you the link. Thank you. Oh but it's really good. It's about where she kind of takes some time off to really get to know herself, understand what she needs. And, you know, it's just, I'm not going to ruin the book for you. It's mm -hmm. really, really good. But she talks about when you're practicing self-care and asking yourself in the moment, whether you're picking up a cigarette or whether you are engaging in an unhealthy relationship, like, are you practicing self-care? And so one of the main reasons I wanted to bring you on to the podcast was to talk a little bit about that. And you've touched on a couple of pieces already, because as you know, we're in the middle of a month long self-care series where I am mm -hmm. really encouraging women to start today, right? Let's not wait until January 1st or December 31st to set these resolutions. Let's start now on getting things together and practicing self-care in a variety of different ways. And one of the pillars that I talk about often is health flow. And I focus on three, I guess, three areas within there. So it's physical, mental, and emotional. And you've talked about quite a few of those, but I want to get your thoughts on how capacity and intuition are intertwined when we're talking about self-care from a physical or from a health standpoint? Mm -hmm. I feel like you almost can't have one without the other. You know, if you are living completely disconnected from your intuition, then your capacity is automatically impacted because you are living in priority of everything outside of yourself. So how could you possibly ever prioritize the things that are important to you if you have never prioritized you, you know, you gave me how can, <laughs> oh. if you think about that, right? Like how could I ever show up as the best person for my job? If I don't feel good, how can I show up in my marriage as the best partner I can be? If I don't feel good, how can I show up as the best mother I can be? If I don't feel good, then everyone that I interact with is getting shortchanged mm -hmm. because I don't feel good enough to present myself wholly, you know? So everyone around me is getting that half. Like, you know, when you, uh, what's that saying? You're trying to do too much. So you end up doing nothing. Yes, absolutely. It's that same way when you are not 
investing in yourself mentally and emotionally, everything else falls apart around you. And the thing is, then you also start to feel a little bit resentful because you're giving and you're giving and you're giving and you're never feeling like you're fulfilled. But there is power in taking control of prioritizing yourself. Like it's not selfish per se to be selfish. It is necessary. Mm -hmm. When I prioritize my sleep, when I work on the things that affect me emotionally, when I work out, when I do things that make me feel good, I show up stronger in my marriage. I show up stronger for my kids. And the thing is, I wish as women that we could also see that the people in our lives that love us already see us as perfect Mm -hmm. and us focusing on our appearance and us focusing on, you know, being this certain size, we're taking away from our relationship with them. Like I think about this is, I'm going to get real personal right now. Okay. That's okay. I don't talk about my cervix and everything. All right. right. Well, you're right. You're right. I just remember when I was in the midst of all of the, that negative feeling I had about myself, like I would tell myself, like, you look good as long as you keep your clothes on, you know, like, Mm -hmm. and right. Like I think about the disservice I was doing to my husband, you know, to be with somebody who loves me and is in love with me, but not giving myself fully to him because I was self-conscious, like what a disservice and a disrespect I was doing to the relationship that I claimed to prioritize. Like, I love you. I will share my home with you. I will share my body with you, but only kind of, because I don't want you to see me in this way. And I don't want you to look at me in this way and wait, you know, wow, Evelyn, Mm. like how, what a disrespect to my marriage did I do by holding myself back for him? Because I was obsessed with my exterior, but he thought I was perfect just the way that I was. He wasn't looking for perfection. He was looking for me. And you just me all along. Yeah. Yes. And I was the only one who didn't see it. My kids think about how many times like you go to the beach and you don't want to be in a bathing suit because you're self-conscious, right? Like your kids don't care about your bathing suit. They want you to get in the water. Listen, I, I just experienced this about a month or so ago. I took a little staycation at a hotel. Mm. And I had my son come like later that Sunday because I stayed until Monday. And I realized that I never really get in the water with him. Right. Mm -hmm. And so on the way he called and he's like, well, he was with my husband. He's like, do you have your swimsuit? Because you never get in the water with me. Mm -hmm. I just really want you to get in the pool. And so I put everything aside. Mind you, it wasn't nobody even in the pool because ain't nobody Mm -hmm. staying in hotels right now. But in my mind, I was like, oh my gosh, I still got some stuff here. I got some stuff there. I don't want to put that swimming suit on, but I did. And we had the best time ever. And he said to me afterwards, he said, mommy, I've been waiting for this day my entire life. I'm so happy. This was the best day. So yeah, we got to stop doing a disservice to the people Mm -hmm. who love Mm -hmm. us. We're fine the way that we are. Yes. And all in the name of what? What is it that you're trying to feel by reaching this perfect body, right? Like, let's say that I lost 30 pounds tomorrow and had ripped abs. Mm -hmm. Would I be a better coach? Would I be a better mom? Would I be a better wife? No, because changing my exterior does not change my heart. I now live in confidence. I now know that I am worthy of all the effort I put into everybody else. I know that. So any exterior change that happens just happens, but it doesn't change who I am. And the funny part is the stronger I feel inside, the better I feel about myself. And the more I focus on my worth, the better my choices are. And my body honestly has naturally changed on its own. Mm -hmm. Um, I work out regularly because I really enjoy it. I like lifting heavy weights. I like feeling strong, but the better choices that I make for myself, the more I am focusing on my intuition, Mm -hmm. the more I'm connecting with my body, the more I just learn to live in a way that instead of punishes myself for how I ate, 
I just choose to constantly nourish physically, mentally, emotionally. And I'm muscular, I'm leaner. And all of that was a byproduct of me being happier. So it didn't happen the other way around. What I heard in all of that is that in addition to self-care being an inside job, looking good on the outside is an inside job. Yes, 100%. Matters, yes, exercising, but how you feel about yourself, the way that you nourish yourself mentally, emotionally, and physically is a byproduct of how you look on the outside. Mm-hmm. Girl, I need that on a t-shirt. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm telling you, it's like the better that I felt about myself, the more I just naturally wanted to do better for myself. So instead of saying to myself, like, I'm going to get on the treadmill and run because I ate a donut yesterday, it was, let's go for a walk as a family because that's when we have the best talks, you know, or instead of I'm going to have cinnamon rolls with my breakfast, I'm going to have some fruit with my breakfast because I notice when I eat fruit, I feel more energized and I'm more focused on my work. So when I start looking at my food and my exercise as things that fuel my mind, Mm -hmm. then I naturally gravitate toward that because I always want to be my best. I always want to show up for the people that I love. I just want to be here. So being able to change that why, why do I want this? What am I looking for? When I was able to change my why, my body changed very quickly after. I love that. And also what I'm hearing is that you have to have the time, right? Time meaning time and space to really think about these different things. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned earlier about intuition and capacity going hand in hand. And so I just want to reiterate that again, because if you are running around constantly worried about everybody else and everything else, you won't have the capacity or room to even take the time to think about what it is that you need, what it is that works well, or to to come up with a different why. And so Mm -hmm. I want everybody to understand really and truly how linked capacity is to everything that we just talked about. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to ask you something else too. I know when folks hear this, it'll be closer to the end of December and, you know, everybody is going to be on their new year, new you or new me sort of Mm -hmm. kick. Mm -hmm. And I've been seeing a lot about like three-day resets, five-day resets, (laughs) cleanses, those sorts of things. So I know, but listen, coach, I'm going to need you to set us straight right quick and talk to us a few minutes about the reset. And then I'm going to ask you some questions. I ask everybody and let you get up out of (laughs) here. Okay. So let me just be the first to say, I cannot stand. Let me sip my water. Yes. Take a sip of water. I cannot stand when somebody comes at me talking about a reset. Okay. I had someone approach me last year, twice. Not once. Not Not once. once. (laughs) Because once should have been it, right? Right. (laughs) Twice. Why don't you join us? We're going to do a seven-day cleanse and get you a reset. And I'm like, didn't you just do that three months ago? (laughs) Yeah, but, you know, I fell off a little bit and everybody falls off. So we need to reset. And I'm like, listen, first of all, I am not the one. Secondly, If your program worked the first time, I would not have to come and see you again. Okay. So what you're telling me with your reset is that it doesn't work, (laughs) right? It doesn't work. Translation, I'm going to be resetting for the rest of my life because this is not sustainable. You're getting me to starve myself for several days. You're calling it a cleanse, but essentially I am dropping my caloric intake dramatically, starving myself for several days in a row in the, in the name of losing weight, which with a little bit of study, you would know all you did was drop some water weight, mm-hmm. you not lose fat that quickly. No. All in the name of losing a few pounds only to then rebound and have to do it again. So when I see people saying in the new year, I'm going to have a new me, I'm going to eat different. I'm going to exercise. I say like, Stop waiting for the new year and start making choices right this second. And I'm not talking about cutting things out. I'm not saying stop eating sugar. I'm not saying stop eating carbs. 
I'm saying start adding things into your day that make you feel good. And I mean, choose one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. So if you can say to yourself, I don't really drink much water. Okay. So for the next week, every day, you are not going to put any pressure on yourself about food. You're only going to say, I'm going to drink more water every day. And every day that you do that, you're going to celebrate that win because you showed up for yourself. Yes. And that's what builds momentum. You know, people, I feel like also believe that healthy and fit people are always motivated mm. and they're not. Set them straight, you know? coach. Set I, don't, straight. <laughs> I don't always want to work out, but I never regret it when it's over. Right. So it's a matter of putting consistency over motivation and realizing that every time I show up for myself and do something I said I was going to do, I prove to myself that I'm worth it. Every time, if I drank more water today, I'm going to celebrate because I told myself I was going to do it and I came through. And can I so add tomorrow, to that? Row, yeah. That you, you're learning how to trust yourself too. Yes. Like Loosen that in back from what we said earlier, right? Especially if you've built this pattern of not trusting yourself mm-hmm. or you believe that you can't, or you constantly let yourself down. If you focus on one thing at a time, like you said, adding in a little bit more water, Mm -hmm. you rebuild that trust with yourself. Absolutely. That is what's going to help you Mm -hmm. in the long run for sustainability. You know, and I feel like that is the hugest factor that was helped me to break free from dieting. Because like I said, dieting gave me that sense of control. Mm -hmm. I was in control of my food. Therefore, I was in control of my body. But truly, the opposite of control is trust. You have to trust yourself to let go of that control. And the more you dabble in showing up and making small changes and proving to yourself, like, I got you, the more you trust yourself and you let go of that control. Because now you know, your body's telling you what it needs, you're listening to it, you're tuned in, and you're making the best choices for yourself. And you're also understanding that it takes time. Your results will not be linear. You're not going to say to yourself, I'm going to start making better choices tomorrow. And then every day is easy after that. No, some days suck. (laughs) They do. (laughs) Right. Some days you're stressed out and your face is in a bag of chips. That's going to happen. All of your old habits don't just go away because you said you want them to. Right. (laughs) Maybe you'll be sneaking out and eating Oreos at 3 a.m. You see me me eating top of Tito's. Yes. (laughs) My favorite chip, by the way. (laughs) Mine is a Cape Cod sea salt and vinegar those are really good my son they're so that. good I don't do sea they're salt so good vinegar, but he oh. loves them oh so it's, it's just cool. a, yeah I just you know when you can let go of that control and you can focus on trusting yourself first of all no food is off limits okay no food is off limits because you know that you can have a little bit it satisfies whatever it was that you wanted and you move on keep it moving yeah you keep it moving you keep it moving because your focus is now nourishment as opposed to punishment. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. You can make me put all kind of posts and tag you and all kind of stuff. <laughs> you have so many gems in here. Do it. So I want to ask you a couple of questions. Sure. And then after that, I want to find out what you're working on, what okay. we can expect from you, how we can follow you. So I ask everybody these questions because it's interesting to really see the variety of different answers. Mm. And part of me just kind of wants to, wants to see how similar they are to me. <laughs> Even though I already okay. see soul sisters, girl, I'm not worried. I know, I know. <laughs> okay, so if you could go back in time mm-hmm. and meet with the 17-year-old version of yourself and oh. give her one piece of advice and one piece of advice only, what would it be and why? Mm. I would tell her, you are so much more than what you look like. Mm. You are just so much more than what you look like. Mm. Ooh, that's deep. You know, I felt that. (laughs) Mm. My 17 year old self felt it too, man. (laughs) Yeah. Like to go back and be like, Hey chick, you're more than what you look like. Mm -hmm. It -hmm. would change the trajectory for me for a whole. You don't have to look good to feel good. No, you don't. You're so, you're so worth it already. You're already enough. You're already enough. Mm, I love that. Mm. Okay. 
Since we are on the Flow and Flourish podcast, Mm -hmm. tell me what you do to make sure that you flow and flourish on a regular basis. I make sure to prioritize my time. And I mean that in work, in home, in family, and constantly check in. I make sure that my work time is scheduled so that I can prioritize my work. And when I have my family time in, it's uninterrupted. When I have time with my husband, we're checking in. We are communicating like crazy. So it's about being present every step of the way. That's real good. Yeah. Around here, we schedule all kinds of stuff too. We Mm -hmm. schedule dinner. We schedule um, Nicole and Darius time. We schedule Mm -hmm. time with each kid. Is it perfect all the time? No. No. Right. But we at least attempt Mm -hmm. to make sure that we're getting stuff scheduled because of that whole time management piece. Yep. Good. Yep. Okay, we have talked a lot about a lot today, but if there's one thing that you want the listeners to walk away or take away from our time, what would it be? That you can want to change your body and still love yourself now. You're never going to be able to hate yourself then. So real change comes from loving yourself and choosing yourself. So You have to always approach yourself from a place of compassion and gratitude and your exterior will follow suit. It's a byproduct. Like you said, It's a byproduct. Okay. It's a byproduct. (laughs) (laughs) Now tell everybody what it is that you're working on. If there's, you know, if you're taking clients right now, if you will be in the future, because I know a bunch of my listeners are going to be like, you know what? She's a real deal. Yeah. (laughs) So, especially since you're telling us to go buy chocolate and stuff, girl. (laughs) Listen, could you imagine saying like, we're going to have our group coaching session and please bring your chocolate and your wine. And yeah. 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 (laughs) (laughs) So January 16th actually is going to be the start date of my uh, eight week group coaching program. And it's a program in which we focus on mindset intuition and what I call the five pillars of health, because we can't only focus on food and exercise to change our bodies. There's so much more to it. We do four weeks of education and four weeks of implementation where you get, you know, real time feedback and, you know, learn how to continue going from there. I will not tell anybody how much weight you're going to lose at that time, because we are focusing on changing from the inside out. But I will tell you that when you master those tools, you are never going to be starting over because Mm. what you learn is going to be forever. So eight weeks, group coaching. I did want to put out a little freebie, if I can, for your, for your base here. The, um, yeah, so I love freebies too. Free is my favorite price. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, free 99. So If they go to www.evelynfit.com forward slash claim it, they can get not only a resource, my three greatest tips to avoid holiday weight gain, but also I'm going to be doing a free webinar January 3rd to teach you how to not get stuck making New Year's resolutions that won't stick. So to help you get on the right path and start your year off strong, committing to yourself. I love that. And I'll include all of that in the show notes too. So I'll just connect with you after this to have you send it to me so we can put it in there. And then we're also going to do a live that Friday. Mm -hmm. Is that January 1st or Um, whatever? I don't, let me care of the calendar, which I mean phone because... (laughs) (laughs) Whoever gets to it first, my daughter reorganized my um January my 1st. Okay, perfect. So join us January 1st live. I haven't decided if it's going to be on Facebook or Instagram because I'm in okay. the middle of trying to decide, but it'll be one of the two places. You'll hear all about it, listeners. So make sure that you connect with us, reach out to Evelyn, follow her on Instagram. Tell us where we can find you to connect with you. Yeah. So on Instagram, Facebook, and Pinterest now, actually, I am at Evelyn Levasseur Fitness and my website, which has a lot of blogs and tips specifically for mommies who are trying to reach 
their goals is www.evelynfit.com. Thank you so much again for being here. You are so amazing. And I'm so thankful that you were able to share your expertise. And I know that this is going to bless a whole lot of women. So thank you. I hope so. Thank you for having me. And I love our conversations. (laughs) I do too. Was this not such a very good episode? I told y'all that Miss Evelyn is the bomb and she came packed with so much knowledge. I hope that you're able to take away a couple of different things that you can start applying right now in your life. I know for me, one of the biggest takeaways that I have is that if you are obsessing over food in your body, you're not practicing gratitude. So keep that in mind this week, throughout this year, as you start to build the life that you desire. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and please leave me a rating. It really does make a huge difference. I also want you to make sure that you go on over to my website, to Facebook or Instagram and check out your capacity. Because what you may not realize is that when you are at max capacity, that means you don't have any room for anything else. So if you're trying to change your mindset, if you are trying to change your habits, you have to really have the capacity to do that. And the first step to increasing your capacity is by really becoming aware of where you are. So head on over to NicoleRone.com, take the free capacity calculator assessment, and then let me know what you think about it. So tag me in social media or DM me on either platform. And if you want to just send me an email, you can do that too. But take the assessment so you can see where your capacity lies. And until we connect again, I really look forward to continuing to be your capacity coach and helping you increase your capacity so that you can show up in excellence in every single area of your life. Thank you.